Jesus, come join us in our journey as we seek your will for this community and this environment. Teach us to love each other as you love us, to give ourselves as you give yourself, that the kingdom of God may be made present to all. Amen. Again, we hear another parable from Jesus to the authorities because this event takes place after, of course, Passover, about the time of Passover 30 AD when he entered the city. And one of these events that took place there also was that Jesus was looking for some, he was hungry in the morning and he looked over and saw a fig tree and he went over to the fig tree looking for some fruit on it, but he found none. But it wasn't the season for figs anyway, but he still cursed it and the tree withered. And that was a prophetic sign to the nation of Israel that they were not producing fruit. Because on the Sermon on the Mount, he said that you will know them by their fruit. And so he taught each day in the temple area during this time frame, debating with the other teachers of differing beliefs. He was invited to state his opinion on a number of issues, including marriage and the resurrection, the greatest commandment, and the question of paying taxes to the Roman emperor or not. Now that was a test question for the zealots, another political party of the day, because they hated the Romans so much in their eyes, acknowledging the rule of a pagan king by paying taxes was horrible. And so therefore, they thought they would get Jesus in trouble when the Pharisees asked this question. And so Jesus replied that the coinage which the taxes had to be paid belonged to the Roman emperor because his face and his name were stamped on it. So let the emperor have what obviously belonged to him, Jesus declared. It was more important to make sure that God received what was due him. This answer disappointed those patriots who followed the zealot line. Neither did it make Jesus popular with the priestly authorities. The rebellious spirit in the land terrified them. Their favorite position with the authorities and the Romans were going to be in jeopardy. If revolt broke out, the Romans would, of course, hold them responsible for not keeping the people under control. So they were afraid when Jesus might provoke an outburst that could bring the heavy hand of Rome upon the city. The enthusiasm of the people when Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey alarmed the religious authorities. So did this show of authority when he cleared the temple of the traders and the money changers. That was another prophetic action on his part in the tradition of the prophets of Israel. Its message to the priestly establishment came through loud and clear. The prophet Isaiah, his vision of the temple where he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. Now, it was a fine ideal. But any attempt to make it measure up to reality was a threat to the priestly privileges. Jesus' action was disturbing as Jeremiah's speech was in his day, 600 years before, foretelling the destruction of Solomon's temple. So this Sunday's gospel finds us again with Jesus in the temple, teaching about the kingdom of heaven. As you recall from last week's gospel, when Jesus was at loggerheads with the priests and the elders, he told them a parable about their behavior when they refused to answer his question about John the Baptist. He likened their behavior to two sons who paid lip service to their father when it came time to work in the vineyard. One was obedient, the other was not. Now he continues this analogy with his parable today, hitting even closer to home about the owner of the vineyard who planted the vineyard and then went away and leased it out to tenants. And when harvest time came, he sent servants to collect his due, but they beat one, and they killed some others and they stoned others. Uh, they treated their servants of this master very badly. And so finally he says to himself, oh, I'll send my son, they'll respect my son. Well, they didn't because they said, oh, this is the heir, assuming the father had died. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And that's what they did. So Jesus' question was, what's he gonna do to those tenants? And they all said, well, they're gonna, he's gonna come and kill all those guys. So he says to them, you know, the stone that the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. It's the Lord's doing and amazing in our eyes. He was quoting from Psalm 118. And so therefore, when he mentioned the word vineyard to them, they knew that he was referring to Israel. The Old Testament's fifth chapter of Isaiah makes this analogy of Israel to be the vineyard of the Lord. So he was right in line with the other prophets when he told this parable. Psalm 80 also refers to Israel as a vine that God brought out of Egypt and planted it. So God is the landowner who's looking for a share of the crop as his most justly due. When Jesus said, therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom, they really got angry because they knew the parable was against them. There was no doubt in their minds it was time to get even with Jesus. 
In the context of the parable, Jesus becomes a prophet as he tells what will happen to the messengers of the owner and finally to the son who was killed. It's a prophetic story about what is and what will take place afterwards. It's a story about a very bad stewardship by the tenants, how they react in their pride to being asked to produce the fruits of their stewardship. The most immediate point of the story is the fact that the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. When we read the parable of the vineyard or the parable of the tenants who killed the son, we see the leaders of the people who have become used to having the property that belonged to someone else and then being willing to use violence to keep what they had. They were not willing to admit their responsibility to the owner and tried to act as if it all belonged to them anyway. To secure their ambitions, they killed the owner's son and the heir, hoping thereby to succeed to the property. But the owner came and he threw them out. When we consider this story from a stewardship point of view, then we see that we are stewards of riches, which belong to the Lord of creation. Those riches include not only those parts of the natural world and the life and the culture of humanity, which is placed in our hands, but also our own bodies and our very lives. Like anyone put in charge as stewards of what belongs to someone else, if we have it long enough, and especially if we are not being called to account, uh, we are easily tempted to imagine that it probably owns us, belongs to us anyway. And so we can do what we want with it. So the great error of human pride occurs to let our God given control of what God has given us, deceive us into denying that we owe anything to our creator and displacing onto ourselves the sovereignty of God. It's easy to forget whose we are and that we are clay in the hands of the potter as Jeremiah saw it. The greed of the unruly tenants in the parable of the vineyard is the natural greed of fallen humanity. It leads to killing the one whose very existence reminds the tenants that they are not Lord of the vineyard the point of the story turns on his death, the death of the son and the heir. We who know that Jesus is the son and that God raised him to rule with him also know that. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's the Lord's doing. It's amazing in our eyes. It is as well for us to remember as well that those qualities we share with the rest of humanity which led to his rejection. To exalt in our knowledge of his becoming the cornerstone without first confessing our identity with the killers would miss the point of the story. True believers in the son are those who know how closely they are related to the tenants who killed him. Just like the poor and the lame who were brought in from the highways and the byways to the wedding feast of the king, which is the story we'll hear next week. The Gentile church who God called when the Jews rejected the gospel are beneficiaries of the, of the vineyard and the wicked tenants who have been thrown out. But it's not our doing, it's the Lord's doing and it's amazing in our eyes. But as the inheritors, we also run the risk of being dispossessed of the vineyard through failure to acknowledge its true owner and his messenger. Only by remembering whose we are and keeping our focus on him can we avoid the temptation of falling back into the error of the tenants, which is the general cause of all human failings, namely denying God. The parable reigns, remains good news to those who know they are in need of the grace of God. It's a story that talks about the fact that, you know, in the great bazaars of Istanbul and Damascus or Cairo, one can see men sitting at their places in, this, in the silversmith section, and they got piles of coins there that are melting down and they're fashioned into little silver charms and sold to the tourists. And it's done in the old fashioned way. The silversmith drops the coins into the molten silver. And while the coin is melted down under the hot fire, every once in a while, he'll take and, takes a sieve and scrapes off the impurities on the top, looks intently into the bowl, and if you ask him, uh, what are you waiting to see? He would say, I keep on the fire there until there's no more scum, until I can see myself reflected as in the best mirror. This is what the Old Testament prophet Malachi means when he says, God shall sit as a refiner of silver. God says, I'm going to make my people holy. I'm going to keep them in the fire until all the jealousy, the hatred, and the self-seeking has been scraped away. I'm going to keep them in the fire until all that remains is pure shining silver of patience, kindness, compassion, understanding, and loving service. Then I will see my face in them, and then I will know that my people have been made holy. The point Jesus is making in this parable, however, applies to everyone. We are entrusted with the gospel. Whenever we forsake the gospel, you'll be given to others to share. The honesty and the integrity of our faith is based not so much on whether we do or do not make 
certain moral behaviors, but whether we have shared the good news with others. The judgment of Jesus will be based on the fruits of the, our faith, not on our personal purity. There was a young single woman who had a job as a waitress and was bringing friends to church on Sunday. Occasionally they came back and several even became members of the congregation. She was wealthy only in the fact that she had a lot of friends where she worked and she brought them to the place that sustained her spiritually. When she died, the church was packed with her friends. The celebrant at her funeral connected her goodness to her bringing others to faith. You know, someone once asked her, said, Jane, how do you do it? You, you seem to make it so simple. She said, I don't know. I just ask them and they come. I know I need to be here and I think my friends do too. If the gospel were really transforming your life, wouldn't, it be, wouldn't you want to offer that to everyone else? Jane did. She is one of the ways Jesus tends to the vineyard. By your baptism, you are a vine dresser as well. Jesus is asking you to apply the good news in your life so that others will see it. Jesus asks you to share it with those with whom he has given you as friends. These words I have spoken in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.